If we want to live and work in space for long periods of time, we'll need to conquer the lack of gravity and its effects on the human body. We we'll want to come up with some kind of artificial gravity. Now, futurists imagine huge rotating space stations, but realistically, there are strategies that could provide artificial gravity for the times that we need it and allow us to survive in space forever. Once again, science fiction has ruined our expectations about space exploration. Star Wars, Star Trek, aliens, you name it, they've got magic gravity holding their feet to the floor. Special nod to the Martian and Interstellar for trying to tackle it in a scientific way with rotating structures. But we don't have magic. We've only got reality, and reality says that if you're in microgravity, you're going to be floating around. NASA astronaut Scott Kelly spent 340 days on the International Space Station studying the effects of long-duration spaceflight. When Kelly Soyuz capsule landed in the steppes of Kazakhstan, he was once again in the gravitational embrace of Earth. As he took his first few steps, it was clear that walking had become immensely difficult for him. His legs didn't do what they needed him to do anymore. Over the next few hours, he became stronger and more coordinated, but still weak, and the lack of gravity had done a number on his sense of balance and coordination. And thanks to the hours of daily exercise, Kelly had minimized the amount of bone and muscle loss, but only gravity can prevent vision problems, an impaired sense of balance, and redistribution of fluid in the body. And when we travel to space to live, not just for a year, but for decades, and maybe even generations, we're gonna need to supply our own gravity. Until the Pandoran unobtainium mines are at full capacity, the only way that we know to generate artificial gravity is through rotation, thanks to centripetal force. In fact, if you've ever ridden the Gravitron at the fair, you know what it's like to experience artificial gravity. And if you've thrown up moments after getting off that nightmarish whirly gig, you know full well what the downsides can be. What work is being done to figure out practical artificial gravity? What kinds of structures make the most sense? Do we need to go big? Could we go small? When you're standing on Earth, you're being accelerated downwards at 9.8 meters per second per second. Of course, the Earth is pushing back at you, so you don't go anywhere. And that's the force of gravity that you feel. Rotation can provide the same force. Think about what it's like to be in a car going around a tight corner car is turning, but you want to keep going in a straight line, so you feel a force pushing you sideways. You're experiencing circular acceleration. To experience artificial gravity, all you need to do is stand on the inside of a spinning cylinder and let this circular acceleration mimic the force of gravity. The distance from the center of rotation changes the amount of gravity you experience. If the size of the rotating spacecraft is too small, then you'll be experiencing different gravity between your head and your feet, and that's where the nausea sets in. Samantha Glasner recently wrote an article for NewSci where she crunched the numbers for the Endurance spacecraft in Interstellar. You know, that cool rotating wheel with all the modules on it? According to Glasner, it has a radius of 29.3 meters, so if it was turning fast enough to give astronauts 1G at their feet, they'd experience about 0.93G at their heads. This would cause blood to flow from their head to their feet and cause lightheadedness and other problems. You wouldn't want to raise a generation of children in that kind of gravity. You'd want to go bigger. In 2001, A Space Odyssey, the rotating space station in the beginning of the movie is apparently about 280 meters across, which means that it turns 1.7 times per second. This would give inhabitants roughly 1G, with minimal differences in gravity from your head to your feet. The problem is that the space station is enormous. To build structures like that would require a launch capacity we can barely comprehend. Let's do some quick math. According to a few sources, the mass of Space Station 5 is 68,000 tons. The upcoming BFR will have the ability to put 150 tons into low Earth orbit. In other words, you need about 450 launches of the BFR to put the gear into orbit to build the station, not to mention assembling it. Now I know, we get all that metal from asteroids and the moon and so on, but this is a long-term goal after we've got a huge space infrastructure going. Right now, we've got microgravity, and we know there are health downsides. So can we improve on that? 
Back in the 1960s, NASA's Langley Research Center built the Rotating Space Station Simulator. It was a 12 meter diameter ring that spun around between 3 and 10.5 revolutions per minute. This gave subjects between 5 and 75% the force of gravity. They were supported against the force of gravity from Earth by cables and then asked to perform various functions. Over the next few decades, there were many papers produced on the subject with different ranges of suggested artificial gravities. In general though, between 1 and 6 rotations per minute seemed to be the best speed. Beyond 6 rotations a minute, there'd just be too much vomit cleanup duty. But maybe not, and more on that in a minute. The big question is, how much gravity do we need? We know we evolved in Earth gravity, but can we handle less? The bare minimum seems to be 20% to provide enough friction to be able to even walk around. 30% gives you the minimum amount of gravity to be able to pick up objects and move around a work environment performing various tasks that astronauts would want to be able to do. And over the decades, researchers have argued about exactly which of these is the right amount for each task, whether it's walking around, working, climbing ladders, operating a P5000 workloader, or fighting off xenomorphs. If you wanted to actually generate full Earth gravity, where the space station is rotating about twice a minute, you need a space station with a radius of about 225 meters. And again, just for comparison, the orbiting ring in 2001 A Space Odyssey was 280 meters, so that movie was surprisingly accurate. The biggest version of this idea is the O'Neill Cylinder, proposed by the physicist Gerard K. O'Neill. Built from material mined from the moon and asteroids, O'Neill cylinders would have a radius of 4 kilometers with a length of 32 kilometers and the whole cylinder would be set spinning, providing artificial gravity on the inside. With a radius this large, very few people would experience any kind of motion sickness, but you might be able to detect the rotation by turning your head back and forth or while running around. But again, if Space Station 5 would keep the BFRs at full capacity for the next few decades, you don't want to know how much it would take to make a full O'Neill colony. So let's ask another question. What would keep us healthy? How much gravity do we need to survive in long periods of space? Would we be willing to give up comfort for artificial gravity that helps us deal with the health factors that only gravity can handle? Vision, balance, and fluid redistribution. And we'll look at prototypes for that. But first, I'd like to thank Tom Cliff, Torben Bellstrom, Teton Saltes, Joseph Hart, Jesus Bargasa Lopez, Don Dillon, David Malone, Ken Hodges, Mike Osmond, and the rest of our 803 patrons for the generous support. If you love what we're doing, you want to get on the action, head over to patreon.com slash universe today. Maybe we can't live and work in full artificial gravity, but maybe we could spend some time to counter the negative effects of microgravity. And space agencies have proposed tiny centrifuges that would provide periods of artificial gravity. Right now, astronauts spend hours every day exercising. Perhaps they can do both at the same time, experience artificial gravity while they work out. And one idea that's quite developed is called Nautilus X, a module or even an entire space station that would provide periods of artificial gravity for astronauts on long duration space journeys. The station would have a main module, 6.5 meters by 14 meters, similar to a module on the International Space Station. But then it would be surrounded by a rotating, habitable centrifuge. The astronauts would work in microgravity, but then spend time resting and sleeping in the centrifuge, experiencing between 51 and 69% Earth gravity. The initial proposal for a demonstration project would cost about $3.7 billion and could be completed in five years. Of course, the project was proposed back in 2011 and hasn't gone any further since then, which seems like a real shame to me. This seems like a natural improvement to the Deep Space Gateway. Recently, engineers from Boeing wondered, how small could you go? Could you just put people in a chair and spin them up and prevent the dangers of microgravity? First, they wanted to find out if humans could become accustomed to the nausea-inducing effect of differential gravity. In other words, if you just spin and spin and spin, will you eventually stop feeling sick? Will you just get used to it? At a test facility at the University of Colorado Boulder, they trained subjects to adapt to a spinning chair. Over the course of 10 days, subjects went from 1.75 revolutions per minute 
to 17.8 revolutions per minute. This corresponds to whirling around in a centrifuge with a radius of only 4 meters. Which means that you could fit this module into various existing rocket fairings like the Falcon 9 and send a small module to the International Space Station. With a radius this small, you could have a centrifuge with enough room for a rowing machine or a treadmill, and an astronaut would then be able to perform their daily exercise while also experiencing artificial gravity. And they'd be doing 15 revolutions per minute to experience 1G, which the preliminary research showed that astronauts should become accustomed to. For a Mars mission, they proposed building a centrifuge with a 5 meter radius of rotation. Two astronauts could be in the centrifuge at a time, balancing each other out. To truly live and work in space for long periods of time, we want to create comfortable artificial gravity. But to just survive and counteract the negative effects of weightlessness, it's surprising to see just how small a centrifuge is required. It's not hard to imagine every long duration space mission including a relatively small centrifuge. Even colonies on other worlds like the Moon or Mars could have a centrifuge that the colonists spend time in to help simulate the pull of gravity. It might be a hassle, but it looks like practical artificial gravity is well within our reach. And it's a technology that we're going to need to crack if we want to live and work in space for much longer. Well, what do you think? Would you be willing to spend a few hours a day in the spin cycle if that meant being able to live in space or on another world? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. People are really enjoying my email newsletter. Every Friday, 10 to 12 cool space stories I'm watching with links to read more. Not just stuff we're writing in the universe today, but from across the internet. So go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. In our next episode, I look at pictures from space. Which ones are real, which ones are illustrations, and which ones are totally fake. That's next time. And finally, here's a playlist.